Well, again, we've been really lucky to hear about great successes from my colleagues. And the real function of me on this panel this morning is to fulfill UMA's last night's stated goal to talk about failures. And so um, the last six years, I've been involved in an initiative where our, my goals are just like everybody else here. First, can we increase the reach, penetration, and impact of our programs? And second, can we do it for more kids and families, um, oh, uh, more kids and families faster and at lower cost? Now in business, they call that a disruptive innovation, but I'm not but, um, and so we've done that, we've tried to do that at the UCLA Family Commons. Our focus on evidence and accountability is just like everybody else's in this room. So I approach this with the same goals and I do have a background in evidence. I have done 22 randomized controlled trials I have to justify this since I'm not going to present a lot of data today. And five of them are multi-city uh, or cross-country trials. And unlike family interventions, the CDC did make a national diffusion strategy for all these HIV prevention trials. And I have nine of those evidence-based interventions with CDC, five, four with SAMHSA. And CDC is out there diffusing them to 2,500 agencies a year. And it's been this experience that convinced me that we're gonna fail. That we have four big problems. Replication with fidelity. In those CDC trainings, 50% of the people they train ever try to implement them. And of the 50% who try, 20% do it with anything that anybody would think looks like fidelity. I think we have four problems with this replication. CBOs make their money because they're special. They know their population. If they can't own the manuals, they're not doing them. Second, we did randomized controlled trials. We have great internal validity, bad uptake. 4.5% of the populations we're trying to reach would be who we let in our trials. Third, I was really impressed with, um, I can't believe I'm nervous, <laughs> uh, with uh, Shelley Taylor got into the National Academies. You might have read her book, Tender Befriend versus men's style of coping, which is fight flight. And all of our research has been on flight fight for 30 years. Well, I would argue all of our evidence-based interventions are tend and befriend. We tried to do Tom Deshaun's um, family checkup with men in piloting for about a year and a half. The wives always filled out the forms. It was not till we went high tech or we started playing sports that we're gonna engage men. I think replication with fidelity is not gonna work until we deal with some of these issues. Our training models have to be different. I've seen too many people who get the scripts right but don't have any competence about what the skills are. And if you don't know the skills, you can't apply them to new situations. We can't allow that and have diffusion of our interventions. Third, we don't saturate settings or children's lives. My grandson is gonna see 40,000 commercials a day. He gets hit by private enterprise 110 times a day. I know my daughter doesn't let this happen, but this is the average kid in America. <laughs> Four hours of media and 10% of all children's meals in the United States are eaten in 23 minutes at McDonald's. If I could have that penetration, we would win. But we don't think about saturating settings with our programs. And finally, we didn't design to the existing funding streams. I thought the ACA was gonna be my potential way to get prevention into families' lives. I don't have the perseverance that David Olds does. He's gotten 1.5 billion, took him 30 years. Rather than us trying to get our research funded after we do it, I think we need to design to the funding streams. So actually I was lucky enough that I won a, almost 21 of those 22 RCTs were funded by feds, 
But the family commons, I won a contest. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded us to try to put, um, see if families would pay for prevention in your local shopping mall. This is a destination space in Santa Monica on the Third Street Mall. It serves, the median income is 82%, although the kids we saw, we gave a sliding scale to 47% of them. This is really a tourist spot for destination, and we wanted to see, could we create a place where people would have drop-in mental health services, kind of like your drop-in CVS clinic, Minute Clinic? And then we got a second, funding for a second family commons at a low-income RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Schools. Now these are six schools on one site. You probably heard about it because they spent $476 million building this school. It's beautiful. It's right in the middle of the, it's also a destination spot. This is where you arrive into LA if you're an immigrant, undocumented, Latino, or Korean. So it's 85% Latino, 15% Korean, 50% undocumented families, and gang infested. The head of the Salvadorian gang is across the street from this school. So we looked at could we take these two sites, both of which were highly desirable settings, and we had a brand, UCLA, gold standard, visible, incredible, and we informed what services we were gonna offer. We were gonna use market-informed um, market surveys to craft what we were gonna deliver. At the school at the, in Santa Monica, we did um, site visits to 197 uh, primary healthcare docs. We got surveys of all the schools, surveys of the PTA, um, all the political people at the school in the low income. It was uh, with administrators and teachers. And then our goal was could we saturate these sites with our programs? And some of our programs were evidence-based, but others were could we put a team in the site that would take advantage of opportunities to saturate the environments. So in Santa Monica, these are the topics that the parents wanted us to cover. And so on each one of these topic areas, we made an expert talk. We reviewed and synthesized the literature. We made what we hoped were sexy slides. We trained people to be able to give talks to parents. We had a website. We put content on the web and blogs. And you had to go to the New York Times and all the kinds of uh, news services so that every time a new study came out, you'd feed it to the parents. And we integrated these um, educational and evidence-based activities into martial arts, coaching, mindfulness, yoga, mommy and me music, mommy and me um, movement, what the community said they wanted and were willing to pay for. We also offered evidence-based offerings. So you might have seen on this list, divorce, 50%, Irwin Sandler's program. We um, adapted Tom Deshawn's family wellness checkup. We had a short version on the mall that was free, kind of like Scient Scientology. We sent students out to the mall. <laughs> then for 50, for 50 bucks, you could have a one se session family wellness checkup. Um, for 95, you got the coaching version of the family wellness checkup, but we integrated, could we make these services less stigmatizing? This is a shot from our website. Costs us 150,000 a year. You have to have a full-time marketer and you have to have a full-time web person. But I think what was key is that my commitment was to, to paraprofessionals, not to people with master's degree. So what distinguished this site was, I think, how we trained and monitored over time services that were being delivered. So first of all, we try to get positive peer deviance. What's that mean? Positive role models, somebody with social skills to begin with. And what we were looking for was you had a talent. You knew something about music, you knew martial arts, you were a dance teacher, you were a music teacher, you did yoga, and then we were gonna train you in evidence-based prevention. And we worked closely with Sharpita and colleagues so that 
we do think there's huge information, more than we're utilizing in those hundreds of, um, SAMHSA has 160, CDC and HIV alone has 115 evidence-based interventions that they're out there diffusing. But we trained on what Sherpita and Daleiden had come up with in their practice-wise interventions, which are now being diffused in five states, 14 skills, he calls them practice elements, I call them skills, are in 80% of all child and adolescent evidence-based interventions. We I, I kind of uh, combined a couple, we trained on 11 of them. And we monitored over time how often these paraprofessionals use these 11 skills, which provides data-informed supervision. My own group also um, rated, the, the, he, he rated over 1,100 manuals. We rated the adolescent HIV prevention, and we came up with 10 principles, rules. And it reads like everything I, uh, everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Be prepared. Cheryl Perry calls it think, think ahead. Um, in Chicago, Castle calls it plan ahead. Um, these are not atypical rules, and I believe, although I don't have the data, but I want to get funded to get the data, that it's common, these rules are common across parenting programs, across obesity prevention programs. They certainly are in HIV, and they're in drug abuse programs. So we trained in a different model. Our, we think of it as a house. All houses have a foundation. Those foundational skills are the Chopita 11 skills and our 10 principles of daily living. And we have a theory that everybody needs to know. I stole it from David Hawkins. Change happens slowly over time with small steps in relationship with opportunities and rewards. Five things. But to get a paraprofessional to know how to apply those, these principles and these five things, it takes, we believe, a year. And the average training for paraprofessional home visitors in the United States, one week. Then unless you have an iterative quality training process after that, we don't think it's gonna go. So then the second level, we were funded, and actually the type of funding, um, Robert Wood Johnson was so generous to make it non-categorical in Santa Monica, but our funding at RFK, the low-income site, is categorical. Social skills, obesity, summer camp. And so we have people trained at this second level in different content areas. And you can only give a paraprofessional about five marching orders and one evidence-based intervention to learn. But again, if you arrive at a home visit, and there's a crisis going on, you're not doing your manual. And how to give people the flexibility but know how to apply the skills that they use to the situation in the home or the obesity. And then our training manual would say, okay, know the foundational skills really, really well. I'm gonna drill you, I'm gonna train you, I'm gonna give you a million examples. Learn a specific content area, and then how you say it, what you do, you're free to do it how you want. We consistently monitored their activities with mobile phones. I said they could only ask three questions. They went and asked five. But they, they bring their scale. They weigh you at, the, at all of our different activities. And then you have data-informed supervision on an ongoing basis. And you can monitor. These are Daleiden and um, Trapita's practice elements. And these are the group data, but I can look at individual community health workers, we call them family mentors, or I can look at the group and know which I have to train more of, and we can look at who's good and who's bad, and we can link them to outcome. What are some of the programs, summer camps? So Bill Pelham, he demonstrated 20 years ago. If you give cognitive behavioral skills to ADHD kids, they work. If our camps were half as good as Bill Pelham's, but twice they have some impact, is that good enough? The criteria for disruptive innovations, is it good enough? So in su uh, summer camps in Santa Monica, totally financially vi viable, 42% of the kids were rated 
um, by our counselors, and we had a clinical psychologist interview all the kids ahead of time as really being kids who were problematic and had si significant behavior problems. Parents were totally uninterested in a middle class environment for evaluation. They're so highly competitive with each other, there was no way that they want to do any kind of monitoring. Um, from the summer camp, we knew we could make the, our program, I'll show you the financial data in a minute, viable based on this. And they, that served as an ability to get people in subscription services for martial arts, mindfulness, and girls groups. And I can tell you that our martial arts was our, by far and away, best parenting program you ever saw. A man did it, men got to watch and role play, and the spontaneous um, disclosures by the fathers about how, oh my God, you made my kid who licked the window clean up his mess? That changed my week. Um, but we don't have good data because the parents wouldn't uh, give it. We got funded in late May last year. Two weeks later, we mounted a summer camp for kids. We had fewer children with problems, only 24%, because I think our brand elicited problems at Santa Monica. We had many follow-up on activities this year, and I can't see the funding stream that's gonna be sustainable, because for both of these activities, I was looking for healthcare funding streams. So we were funded for social skills, and we did a classroom evidence-based intervention. We got a 0 0.6 standard deviation increase by teachers' ratings pre and post. But we thought, and we offered sequentially, that we'd have a control group because some teachers wouldn't opt in. 51 of 55 classes in the elementary schools opted in the first year, so our control group we're trying to get this year. But from our social skills evidence-based intervention, we now have Lunch Bunch. It's a case mix of 50-50, of kids with problems, kids not. Our summer camps were totally based on social skills and management of behavior problems. We have a girls club who's, again, the, the case mix balance, 50-50, problems not. The teachers in all five element, in four elementary schools asked for 10 session, asked for 10, we weren't funded for it, 10 session teacher training this year. We've done family coaching with the most disruptive kids. And all of the, it's funded by a different source, Educare um, in, Calif in California. All the after school um, teachers have been trained in social skills. So we try to saturate the RFK campus. Similarly, we did Cheryl Perry's catch program, evidence-based, we were funded for obesity. But uh, what our leadership team at the school does is looks, where's the opportunities for obesity? Because it's great if you do it in the classroom. I can tell you we had no effect on BMIs um, in the classrooms that we did it in. But we have a parents walking group that's been going on for 18 months. And they only began to change their BMIs after four months. Where could we say after, after the first two months that it was operating? Nobody could walk a 15-minute mile when it started, and all but one could walk a 13-minute mile two months later. Salad bars. Kids went up from one to four days a week. Health fairs. First health fair had 700 families, 150 parent volunteers. Second health fair, 1,900 families, um, 250 parent volunteers. Zumba, we started paying $60 before school and after school. We got a little Japanese factory going with the Zumba before school in the morning. And we paid teachers. Now we have high school students doing Zumba 20 minutes before school starts in the morning. Parents doing Zumba in the afternoon. Martial arts was mandated by California but nobody, none of the PE teachers knew how to do it, so our martial artists went in for four months and trained the PE teachers so they could do martial arts, and then we were funded for home visiting. What are we learning? First of all, saturation with prevention creates many vehicles to reach the same goal, but our experience has been the evaluation is really piecemeal. We don't have an overall setting evaluation strategy, and especially when funding is categorical. Technology is basic. It's going to expand our potential to saturate families' life. 
Right now, it often derails family. Maybe you saw the news report last week, 40% of parents are doing text at the evening dinner, but it could be harnessed for pro-social aims. But what we need to buy, begin thinking about, like you just hear, f heard from Dick, and you heard from our colleague in Norway, we need platforms. And part, like Amy showed us a platform this morning for kids with ASD. We need technology platforms for family wellness. We, need, we have unharnessed and gone untapped the many armies of potential prevention promoters. Every soccer coach in America, every um, school, uh, safety officer who are low income, the, the child aides in the classroom, the PE teachers, the swim teachers, the music teachers, these could be armies of paraprofessional prevention promoters and I haven't seen any of our intervention programs go towards them. We need to design to the funding streams. These are the data from the Santa Monica Family Column uh, Family Commons for the first three years. This is summer camp. I knew that I could feed the entire year and make the place sustainable. It could never diffuse nationally, and this was started to see if we could diffuse nationally based on summer camp. But from we had 2,000 square feet in Santa Monica. We made over 1,000 calls to get six classrooms in 100,000 acres that UCLA has, we could not get six classrooms. And the bureaucratic strategies of the university, we had no overhead, we got what's called an enterprise zone, we had lots of advantages and support, but I knew this was never gonna be viable and scalable. Summer camp could have carried all the activities for the year and fed off Social skills group that we charge $375 for for six sessions, our subscription, martial arts. It, you could have sustained that laboratory, but not gone. Um, at RFK, I've always been focused on health funding, but I don't know if it's gonna be viable. The infrastructure leadership costs $38 a month and $42 a month for paraprofessionals. Would low-income families pay $10 a month for wraparound services at their school? I don't know, we haven't tried it. But if we want our children in the next generation not to have their lives saturated with McDonald's, commercials, but with our prevention messages, our big challenge is gonna be, can we retain accountability but move faster at lower cost for more people? I think we're gonna really need to fundamentally rethink how we're gonna expand our reach, our penetration, and our impact. Thank you.